Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Before I start, let me make an announcement for the Zoom or YouTube participants that the, um, this website contains uh, information about the website which is visible on the screen contains a copy of the transparencies as well as copies of photographs of the blackboards so that if you are following this lecture by Zoom or YouTube, maybe it's a good time to, to have a look on this file because uh, you might get some additional lecture notes from this file. All right, so let me start. My name is Piotr Śniady, and today I would like to show you uh, an insight into asymptotic representation theory. I would like to give you a flavor of what kind of questions this theory asks, and in particular, my goal is to um, um, dieses meeting wird ausge aufgezeichnet. Thank you very much. So my uh, my goal is to um, have a link. To, approach, to, to show you that some problems in asymptotic representation theory can be in fact approached from the random matrix perspective. That viewpoint from random matrix theory gives, uh, might help. And uh, I hope that during coffee break, the participants of the conference will explain me how topological recursion might uh, make the results which we see today even better. All right. so. Um, Maybe it's a good idea to make a, a small crash course uh, of what representation theory and asymptotic representation theory is about. Uh, representation theory studies uh, ways, concrete ways in which abstract groups can be realized as uh, concrete groups uh, of matrices. Uh, for example, here we have a triangle on the plane drawn so that the center of the mass is in the original of the coordinate system, so that any permutation of three symbols, one to three, defines an isometry of the triangle. This is a linear isometry. So we get in this way uh, a two by two matrix. So this map, which associates to permutations from S3 to uh, two by two matrices is a representation. We can say that we represented the symmetric group as certain uh, isometries of the plane. Formally speaking, representation is a homomorphism from your favorite group to matrices of some arbitrary size. If you wanted to say it more fancy, you can say that you have homomorphisms to endomorphisms of some finite dimensional vector space. And um, one language note is that some people prefer to say that representation is this uh, row thing. This is homomorphism, and some people prefer to say that representation is V. So sometimes we'll say that raw is a representation, sometimes we'll say that this vector space, or better say, G module is the representation. This example might give you a false impression that representations are something super easy, and I hope that the next example will uh, remove such uh, illusions. This is a dodecahedron, and it's possible to select eight vertices of the decahedron so that they form uh, the vertices of a cube. In fact, this can be done in five different ways. So altogether, we have five colored cubes inscribed into the dodecahedron. Whenever we have a rotation of this dodecahedron, this rotation clearly defines certain permutation of the five cubes an element of the symmetry group in five elements. If you think for a moment, uh, or maybe a slightly longer moment, you'll see that this permutation, in fact, is always an even permutation. So it's an element of the alternating group. And in fact, there's a bijection. So in this way, we get the bijection between rotations of the dodecahedron and the elements of the alternating group, A5. If you rotate the optics and you look on this bijection from the other side, you get in this way a map, a homomorphism, from the alternating group A5 to uh, isometries of the 
uh, the decahedron. Okay, so this way we obtained a quite complicated representation of the alternating group A5. Uh, the good news or the bad news is that uh, representations or more or bigger groups are even more complicated. So <laughs> representations are not that easy as you can you, you, you could expect from the very first moment. Uh, you might wonder why are we studying representation theory? Are we, are, why are we interested in asymptotic representation theory? So I need to give some excuse, some explanation, and I will give this excuse in the form of three, three sample questions one can ask at. Um, ah, I'm, so, I'm sorry. <laughs> Before giving these three questions, uh, I need to, I need to uh, tell you that some representations are um, less interesting than the others. So such less interesting representations, which I don't like so much, are reducible representations. Okay, so reducible representation is the one which can be decomposed as a direct sum of smaller components. Uh, Concretely, this means that it's possible to select the coordinate system in your vector space so that all matrices associated to elements of your group in, in a universal way, all together, can be block diagonalized in this form. All right, so I don't like such reducible representations. I like irreducible ones, and the irreducible ones play the role of, let's say, prime numbers in number theory. They are the fundamental blocks from which any representation is constructed. In this talk, I will be um, I'll concentrate on representations of a very specific group. This is the Lie group, uh, the compact unitary group UD. And it turns out that there's a bijective correspondence between representations of this group uh, and a combinatorial object between these are weights or highest weights. So a weight is just the vector in which consists of d coordinates these coordinates are integers okay so weight is a vector in zd and we assume that the these coordinates are weakly decreasing if you ignore for a moment that we allow the entries to be negative you can think that the weight is kind of a young diagram and it's a good way of thinking all right so there's a correspondence between irreducible representations of UD and weights, and I'll denote by rho lambda or V lambda, the irreducible representation corresponding to, to lambda. All right, so here come the promised uh, motivations for studying representation theory or asymptotic ones. Uh, the first one is quite practical, comes from the studying of uh, group S52, uh, we have a deck of cards, and the question is how many times you have to shuffle your deck of cards if you are playing poker so that these cards are uh, sufficiently well shuffled. This is a problem from um, probability theory on groups. Essentially, what we are doing is that we are considering a multiplicative convolution in a non commutative group. If we would have this kind of convolution problem on the real line, the answer, the, the right tool is to use Fourier transform. All right, so the good news is that there is a substitute of Fourier transform if you're working with non commutative groups, and this is given exactly by representation theory. All right, so in almost any problem in which you would usually use Fourier transform, you should use the representation theory, and this is the right tool. Uh, the surprising thing about representations is that uh, they appear also in quite unexpected places. And one of them is algebraic geometry. For example, if you ask the following question, how many straight lines intersect given four lines in R3? Okay, you meditate for a moment, you see there are three such lines. Um, but uh, in, what could you say about more complicated questions of this form? Well, it turns out that um, the representations about which I will speak today, uh, in fact, give, uh, give an answer to this kind of questions, and the link is quite surprising. All right, here we come to the, a million dollar problem, to one of millennium problems. Um, there's a movement called um, geometric complexity theory, which has a concrete program which might 
hopefully in maybe 100 years, give uh, proof uh, to um, the conjecture that the class of that certain problems are computationally difficult. And uh, it turns out that if you want to uh, follow this path, you need to construct certain algebraic representation theoretic abstractions for, for fast calculations of certain objects. And these, in fact, are closely linked to representation theory. All right, so these are three good reasons to study asymptotic problems in representation theory. And uh, since I don't want to say too much abstract things, I want to give you a glimpse into this theory by looking on a concrete problem. And this concrete problem is the problem of uh, understanding uh, Littlewood Richardson coefficients. All right, so the starting point is that we are given two irreducible representations, V lambda and V mu of the same unitary group UD, and we consider a tensor product of them. Typically, this tensor product is not irreducible, so it can be decomposed into uh, as a direct sum of irreducible components, and this is exactly what this expression on the right-hand side means. Uh, these uh, C lambda mu nu objects are multiplicities. They count how many given irreducible components appear in the decomposition. Uh, they are called Littlewood Richardson coefficients, and they are quite famous. They appear in various quite distinct places in mathematics. Uh, and in fact, one of the Mm, biggest problems in algebraic, com algebraic combinatorics of 20th century, open for many decades, was in fact to show correctness of a certain algorithm, uh, which was in fact given already by Littlewood and Richardson for calculating these numbers. So for many decades, uh, we knew how to calculate these numbers, but we didn't know why this algorithm is correct. All right, uh, so now the situation is settled. However, this algorithm is so computationally uh, expensive that we don't really have an insight into behavior of these quantities. All right, so, um, so how, to, how to address these, how, how, to, how to understand these coefficients and the scaling when your lambda and mu become big in some sense. And asymptotic representation theory has some number of ideas. And one of them is maybe you can translate this question of understanding little Richardson coefficients to a language of probability. All right. So representation the asymptotic representation theory would tell you uh, you should randomly choose a random irreducible component from this interesting tensor product. Okay. Randomly. And then you should ask probability style questions about this random object. If you want to make it in a concrete way, this means that when you're starting with lambda and mu, you should define a certain probability measure, which to any new associates a probability. There's a normalizing factor, which is in the denominator. It's used so that the measure becomes probability, probability sum to one. And the probability of new should depend on two things. First is the our favorite, beloved, uh, little Richardson coefficient, C, and the second factor is dimension of the representation. So this way, representations which, uh, in, in this way, this probability measure is proportional to the total dimension of all irreducible components of your favorite type you, are, you want to understand. All right, so the problem became probabilistic what can you say about statistical properties of new in the limit when parameters tend to infinity, when d tends to infinity, when lambda tends to infinity, when mu tends to infinity? All right. Uh, I, need to, I need to tell you a bit about, um, about notation. Um, in order to be precise, if you want to address an asymptotic problems, you cannot just speak about lambda. 
we need to speak about the sequence of lambdas. And same for mu. So formally speaking, we are, we, we, our starting point is not a single lambda, but it's a single sequence of lambdas, sequence of mu's, where the diff uh, element of my sequence has d components. Okay, so we have sequence of mu's, sequence of uh, lambda sequence of, of mu's, uh, and we have a, a sequence of real numbers. Um, I call them Planck constant and write it at h with a funny hat. Uh, the name is not, this name is not, uh, not a co coincidence. In fact, it's, I will see that it has some physical meaning. Um, this uh, sequence of real numbers should converge to zero. And essentially, it tells you how quickly lambda and mu grow. So typically, you know, entries of lambda and entries of mu are integer numbers. And if you want your problem to be meaningful, you should make these integer numbers big. Okay, so this Planck constant is used it's a number so that if you shrink down all these lambdas and mu's by the factor by Planck constant, you should get something which is bounded. And this is the meaning of this blue assumption. Uh, in fact, I don't want to be super precise in this moment what, what I really assumed, assume here. And in a couple of minutes, we'll see um, what is the best way to state this blue assumption uh, about the limit behavior of lambda and, and mu. If you like Young diagrams, you can think that lambda is a Young diagram and Planck constant tells you in which way you shrink this Young diagram so that it converges to some nice limit shape. Uh, new D, okay, now we don't have just new, we have new with index d. Okay, so new d is a random irreducible component of this tensor product which appears in little Richardson product. And our problem is what can we say about Planck constant multiplied by new? As you can see, the number d appears everywhere on the slide um, and it's a bit annoying. So to keep the notation light, I decided to to write this number D with gray numbers, uh, gray font. And from the following on, you will not see this D anymore. But it's, you should keep in mind that it's there. So we are considering limit as D tends to infinity. Uh, so this is my problem. And here comes the solution to this problem. Uh, the idea is to uh, pass, the first step is to pass from the representation of the Lie group to representation of the Lie algebra. Um, Lie algebra is the tangent space to our Lie group and the identity. So passage from the representation of the group to representation of the Lie algebra is just taking derivative of our representation in identity. All right, so the good news is that the Lie group of the unitary group has a super nice, easy structure. Uh, this Lie algebra, okay, you have to consider its comp complexification, but this is a really small issue. This Lie algebra turns out to be simply the matrix algebra of all matrices of size D. All right, so this means that my representation of, my, my representation raw now is a, is a function which maps the matrix algebra to endomorphisms of some finite dimensional vector space. And the fact that my original representation of the group was a homomorphism, was a group homomorphism, is translated into uh, the fact that the Lie algebra representation preserves the bracket. This means that um, if you take the commutator, of two matrices corresponding to uh, X and Y, this is the same as taking the commutator, taking the Lie bracket, and then applying the representation. All right, so from the following on, we essentially will forget completely about the Lie group 
forget about the representation of the Lie group. So the following on rho is just representation of the Lie algebra. In fact, I could have started from the very beginning with a representation of the Lie algebra, but uh, it's more difficult to convince people that representations of Lie algebra are interesting. All right, the, I promised you um, perspective of random matrix theory, and here comes a kind of a, the main hero of this talk, a matrix which we'll view as a kind of random matrix. This matrix was um, introduced um, a really long time ago by Perilomov and Popov, and this matrix encodes full information about your representation. Uh, this is a D times D matrix, and on the, um, on the intersection of i row and j column, uh, you put a um, Planck constant, okay, just the normalization, but the important part is that we apply representation to the matrix unit. Matrix unit EIJ is a matrix which has, it's a boring matrix, it has almost all zeros, it has only one entry equal to one, and the appropriate row and the appropriate column. Okay, so um, this is the main hero of this talk, and um, Zelobienko looked on this matrix as a huge matrix. So assume for a moment that D is small. So one way of looking on this matrix is that it's a small matrix, D times D matrix, but uh, entries of this matrix are huge matrices produced by representation. Zelobienko said, maybe you should look on this matrix as just a huge matrix, ultra huge matrix, which has D times dimension uh, of the representation rows and columns. So it's a huge, huge, huge matrix. And he uh, calculated the eigenvalues of this huge matrix. He calculated multiplicities, he calculated eigenvalues, to simply put, he calculated the spectrum of this matrix. And it, the, this spectrum is given by quite explicit formula, which we don't need today. The point is that this spectrum of this matrix A depends in a super nice way on your, uh, on lambda, on your weight, if you apply this construction to an irreducible representation. So the moral lesson we get from this slide is that this, it's convenient that there's an alternative way to encode information about the weight, not as lambda, but as a spectrum of this matrix. So in fact, I promised you um, that I will explain in some moment this blue assumption, what does it mean that lambda multiplied by Planck constant converges to some limit. Now I am able to tell you precisely what I want. I want exactly that spectrum of this matrix A converges to some nice probability distribution on the real line. If you want, you can say, let's take it, Wigner distribution or Marchenko Pasteur, your favorite distribution of the real line. All right, so this is. Excuse me, can I ask a question? Yes. Um, how is this spectrum related to the character of the representation, if at all? Maybe it's a good question for a coffee break. <laughs> okay, thanks. I'll ask later then. Yes, uh, it's definitely, it is related, but the way Zilobinko calculated the spectrum was not by characters. All right, we continue looking on this perilom of pop of matrix, uh, but now we change the perspective. Zilobinko looked on this matrix as a huge, huge, huge matrix, and now I want to have a look on this matrix in a different way. It's a, it's a small matrix. It's a D times D matrix. However, the entries of this matrix are matrices. In fact, I want to change my philosophy. If you like uh, non commutative geometry, you like the idea that uh, your random variables, 
might not commute. And this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to declare that such dv times dim v matrices are simply non-commuting random variables. Nothing changes. This is the same object, but I change the perspective on this, this story. Okay, so my algebra of my non-commuting random variables is the matrix algebra of the size given by representation. And the mean value, this is the information which you need to have when you're working with non-commuting non -commuting random variables, is the so mean value is defined as normalized trace, the usual trace divided by dimension. Okay, so nothing changed, it's the same matrix, but now I changed the way I look on this matrix. It's a D times D matrix, and the entries of this matrix are non-commuting random variables. If I have this viewpoint, I'm able to say something which already appeared in Roland Speicher's talk. Namely, I can say that this matrix is unitarily invariant. Being unitarily invariant is defined in the following way. Matrix is unitarily invariant if you, if conjugating by an arbitrary unitary doesn't change the joint distribution of its entries, the D square entries in, in this case. Um, now the, the, the setup has changed. In Ron Speicher's talk, these random variables were classical random variables. Now our random variables are non-commutative random variables, but the notion still makes sense. We just need to say that joint distribution of your D square entries of your matrix is just given by a collection of uh, expected values applied to all non-commutative polynomial, polynomials in D square variables. Okay, so thanks to this philosophical viewpoint, we can say such a statement. And in fact, it's super easy to prove that this, uh, this result holds true. This comes from the fact that our representation of the Lie algebra comes in fact from the representation of the Lie group and there's some nice relationship between action of the unitary group. So in fact, this is super easy, it's based, uh, it's a super easy consequence of the fact that our Lie algebra comes from, representation comes from representation of the group. All right, the bad news is that the entries of this matrix don't commute. Uh, but the situation is not that bad. We're, I'm going to measure, to quantify the extent to which they don't commute. And one way of doing this is to uh, calculate the commutator of some two entries. Okay, so I select two entries, uh, AIJ and AKL, and I want to calculate the commutator. And the good news is that since this is a representation of the Lie algebra, commutator is translated into the Lie bracket in my Lie algebra. Okay, so this way I need to, the outcome of this commutator is representation applied to certain commutator of two matrix units. This commutator is usually zero, sometimes it's not zero, Anyway, if it's not zero, then it contains at most two summons. And this commutator, so in other words, this commutator is a linear combination of at most two matrix units with coefficients plus or minus one. And so in other words, the object which appears over here is the linear combination of this black part on the right hand side is the linear combination of at most two entries of our matrix A. However, and this is the key point, we have, <laughs> we have an additional red Planck constant over here. This Planck constant appears for a very simple reason. We started, there's one Planck constant in first factor here, AIJ, there's one Planck constant sitting in AKL, we absorb one Planck constant here to, to obtain a entry of our matrix A, and we ended up with one extra Planck constant standing in front. 
And so this means that essentially when Planck constant tends to zero and we have an asymptotic situation, then uh, this commutator in some sense will converge to zero. For example, if you assume that the matrix A has operator norm bounded by some universal constant one, then this gives you automatically a super nice estimate on uh, how big this commutator might be. So the moral lesson which we get from here is that asymptotically, as h tends to infinity, the non-commutativity in my matrix tends to zero. All right, so let's summarize what we know so far about this perorom of pop of matrix associated to an irreducible representation. Uh, it's a, we view this matrix as a small D times D matrix with non commutative entries. Uh, we know the spectrum, we know the eigenvalues of this matrix. Um, this matrix is unitarily invariant and the non commutativity of the entries of A is small. Um, if you would consider the situation when, the, when we fix the size of the group, so we fix UD, we don't go with D to infinity, and we just let lambda tend to infinity, then this would mean that in fact that A converges in distribution, that the joint distribution of entries of A converges as um, Planck constant tends to zero to a joint distribution of entries of a unitarily invariant random matrix with specified fixed eigenvalues. And these are random variables which are super nice and we know how to understand them. All right. However, the bad news is that at the end of the day, we want to go with the rank of the group to 10 to infinity. And this will cause some difficulties. All right. So with these observations, I'm able to give you the final answer for my problem. So on this slide, we see the answer for my problem. All right. Uh, we started with a representation of, a representation of the Lie group um, on the tensor product of vector spaces. And since uh, coming to Lie group, Lie algebra is just taking the derivative, this means that if you want to understand how your representation acts, um, how your representation of the Lie algebra acts on such a tensor product, you need to apply Leibniz rule. Leibniz rule tells you that when you have a product, you have to take the derivative with respect to the first summand and do nothing to the second one, plus do the opposite. All right, and exactly, this is exactly what we see in this equality for tensor product of Lie algebra's representations. Representation acts on a tensor product by two summands, one acts on only on V, and the second one acts only on W. All right. This is very nice. And this tells us uh, also, gives us also the information about perorom of pop of matrix associated to the tensor product of representations. This perorom of pop of matrix associated to tensor product consists, can be written as a sum of two D times D matrices. The first summand contains only the part in which we're acting on the first factor on V, and the second summand contains only the action on W. Since these two actions commute, this means that all entries of the left summand commute with all entries of the, of the, of the right summand. Furthermore, if you look 
on the entries of the first matrix and on the second matrix from a viewpoint of non commutative probability, you can just say that they are classically independent. Whenever you have a polynomial, you have two families of non commutative random variables, but they don't, but they commute, each class commutes with metric with random variables from the other class and furthermore if you calculate the mean value of a product of something from the first class and the second class this expected value factorizes just like in the classical probability when you have independent random variables okay so we have entries of the first summand are independent statistically independent from the entries from the, other, the second summand okay and here comes the culmination. We have two summons. Each of them can be seen as a random matrix, as a D times D random matrix with specified eigenvalues. Each summand is unitarily invariant. And what else? That's it. Okay, so if D would be fixed if dimension of our unitary group would be fixed and lambda and mu are huge. This means that simply the probability distribution of a, a random irreducible component of this little Richardson uh, product has exactly the same converges in distribution to um, eigenvalues of a sum of two random matrices with fixed eigenvalues. Okay, so, okay. This is the final answer to this problem. Okay, you might complain that it's not, not a super concrete answer, or you might complain that I didn't really solve this question, but I simply um, transferred this problem to a different department. I just said that, um, okay, this, now this is a problem which my colleagues from random matrix group can definitely solve for you now. I can have my uh, have my uh, afternoon free. Uh, okay, so this is how the, the this this is how the proof would work if D is um, fixed. However, um, the problem is that when um, you would like to make this reasoning precise in the scaling when D tends to infinity, we encounter a problem, and the problem is related to the fact that in my reasoning, I use the argument that the joint distribution of certain non commutative random variables, these are entries of my Perelom of Popov matrix, converges in distribution to a joint distribution of certain commuting random variables. These are entries of a random matrix. The bad news is that when you want to tend with D to infinity, um, there is no limiting object to which you could say that your non commutative objects really converge. So there's a serious problem how to formulate this kind of intuition in a formal way. All right, so those of you who want to have a look on, on uh, how the proof, proof, how the proof really works, then let's have a look on a slightly more detailed proof. Okay, so the idea for the rigorous, how to make this reasoning rigorous in the scaling when d tends to infinity is to essentially revisit ideas which you have seen during the last talk of Ron Speicher. So the idea is that um, whenever you have a random matrix, there are two types of quantities which you could use to describe this matrix. The microscopic quantities and macroscopic quantities. All right, so let's start with the microscopic ones. Microscopic quantities are related to mm, small number of entries of your matrix. So for example, um, typically such an information is, for example, you might ask, you form a polynomial, a monomial in entries of your matrix, and to ask what is its mean value. If you are more subtle, you might ask questions about covariances or cumulants of classical cumulants of higher order, but 
Today, let's stick to simple things first. Okay, so typical quantity, which is a microscopic, is the mean value of a monomial in entries of your matrix. And uh, this is a formula which appeared in the top formula is the one which appeared in Roland's talk. Roland referred to this as Vic formula. And this formula essentially tells you that if you want to calculate such a general monomial, you should look for all permutations, sigma, this permutation uh, is from symmetric group SL. We have L factors here. And this permutation essentially um, permutes, permutes uh, second indices. So we are looking for all ways to permute Js so that they match corresponding Is. Um, th and this is this, the meaning of this black part on the right-hand side. Uh, there is a red part. This is my, um, as a quantity which was denoted in Roland uh, Speicher's talk by K sigma. Um, and this quantity is also a mean, mean value of certain monomial, but this monomial is super easy. Namely, I select, uh, I'm looking on a monomial in A's, which uh, are selected from uh, the first L rows and first L columns. From each row and from each column, I select exactly one entry, and permutation sigma tells me how to match rows and columns. If you are calculating a determinant of a small minor, then this is kind of monomial which appears in, in such a minor. Uh, uh -huh. Okay, so these red quantities, k sigma, essentially carry all information, all microscopic information about your random matrix. Some of these k sigmas are nicer than others. And in fact, this, uh, our emotional attitude to some of them was already seen in Ron's talk. I also like some of these k sigmas more than others. And my favorite k sigmas are the ones which correspond to a long cycle, which permutes all elements. But this long cycle must be of special form. It maps one to two, two to three, two, and so on, and L up to one. The reason why I like this object so much is that somehow it's related to the way we calculate traces. Trace is um, trace of a product also involves this kind of permutation. Another reason why I like this this special sigma so much is that if you scale this k sig this specific k sigma in a, with the right choice of normalization, it this turns out to be equal or almost equal to the free cumulant of your random matrix. All right. Um, yet another reason for studying this specific k sigmas is that they are yeah, additive. This means that if you calculate k sigma for a sum of two matrices, okay, so, okay, okay, one matrix plus second matrix, okay, so you get a huge product, expected value of a huge product, and each factor is a sum of an entry from A and entry from B. A kind of uh, Newton formula tells you that you should have two to the power L summons, but the magic is that most of them are zero, only two of them survive. And it's exactly the one which involves only matrix A and the second one with matrix B. These quantities are additive, just like free cumulants. All right, so, I, these are, so these are microscopic information, and some of them we like more than others. Ah, here we come, we will encounter the macroscopic information. Macroscopic information, yes. You have only two, and these are the ones you see over here. That's the only ones. <laughs> okay, so here comes to the macroscopic information. You ask about things which are related to whole of your matrix. And favorite, an example of a macroscopic information is the following. You take your matrix, take it to the L power, take trace, 
and then take the mean value of this trace. If you are more adventurous, you can try something more complicated. Tra a matrix A to the power L1, trace of matrix to the power L2, and then mean value. But essentially, we are interested in this kind of quantities when we are asking about uh, macroscopic quantities. In particular, when you want to calculate spectrum of a random matrix, it's related to these kinds of, kinds of quantities. You can read it from these numbers. Uh, the, so in other words, our initial blue information about lambda is encoded exactly in this kinds of in this kinds of language of traces of powers of, of our matrix. In fact, if you apply this Vic formula to trace, you see that there is an explicit way to calculate your macroscopic quantities in terms of your microscopic quantities, k sigmas. But, okay, so going, so the moral lesson is that coming from microscopic information to macroscopic is super easy. But the question is, can you go the other way around? And the answer is mm, no. And let's have a look what, why we encounter a problem. Uh, each of these equal, so I'm, I'm going to look on each of these um, equations as an equation. Our unknowns are microscopic quantities, k sigmas. Okay, so my, in the perfect world, the number of equations should be equal to number of uh, variables. So let's check if this is the case. Okay, the, so the number of equations is equal to number of traces, trace style quantities, which you can calculate. So you take uh, powers of A, um, trace of it and mean value. Uh, okay, so if you fix the homogeneous degree to be L, the number of such quantities grows at most like the number of compositions of the number L. So it most grows at most exponentially fast. But the bad news is that the number of equations which you have uh, is equal to number of variables which you have is equal to number of permutations. And this grows like, like factorial. So this means that uh, you have small number of equations and a huge number of inequalities. And in fact, you cannot get information about your microscopic data. The difficulty comes from the fact that um, I was too ambitious and I, from the very start, I considered a matrix, a random matrix, which is unitarily invariant and its matrix don't commute. So if you, if you are, have a, such a matrix with non-commuting random variables, then indeed there's no way to get microscopic information from the macroscopic ones. Typically, you are working in random matrix theory, the entries of your matrix are just numbers and they commute. <laughs> then the situation changes because uh, essentially, if you take into account that you can in fact shuffle your entries, shuffle your A's in the definition of K sigma, then one can, one can use a bit of symmetry, unitary symmetry of your matrix and see that in fact, Mm, these quantities k sigma, they don't really depend on full structure of your permutation. These k sigmas depend only on the, on the length of the cycle. They de depend only on cycle structure of sigma. All right, so if you know that your matrix is commutative, it has commutative entries, then in fact, the number of equalities is equal to the number of partitions, and the number of variables is also equal to number of partitions. You have perfect match and you in fact can solve the system of equations. All right. The good news is that we have a situation in which the matrix entries don't commute, but we have a good control over this, their non-commutativity. Whenever you want to calculate such an evil K sigma, for example, K sigma related to a cycle 
which is evil. It's not cycle one, two, three. It's an evil cycle, uh, one, three, two. Okay. Uh, then, uh, by observing that the entries of your matrix fulfill uh, commutation relation coming from the from the Lie algebra, it follows that you can, in fact, interchange the order of your factors. There is, however, a small price. You have to add a small junk error term, which contains the Planck constant. Okay, so if you make this calculation at the very end, the good news is that you are able to stretch to, to rewrite any of the evil variables which correspond to um, cycles which are not nice in terms of nice cycles which are kind of canonical plus the error terms all right so the homework to finish the proof one has to make sure that in fact this junk is small this is a technical thing however it took me and my co-authors about 10 years to figure out how to make it make it really correct because in fact theoretically it could happen that even though you get junk of smaller degree there is some you know the dimension of your group tends to infinity that there could be another factor of d which would destroy your calculation okay so this means that uh, there is some there is some math to do all right so the rigorous proof goes along the following lines these are the macroscopic data about spectra of our non-commutative random variables about parallel of pop of matrices and on the right hand side we see microscopic data Ron Speicher explained that passing directly from uh, macroscopic data for let's say two random matrices to information about uh, traces of powers of a sum it's a super complicated thing and this is not what you really want to do so direct passage from these traces above to the traces of um, traces of the little Richardson object is not what you really want to do. You need to calculate first the microscopic data. And these are exactly these quantities which uh, Ron Speicher likes so much. And it's some um, slightly more complicated variants. Then these quantities behave in an additive way. So by summing, you obtain the microscopic data for the little Richardson object. And then in an easy way, you recover back the, uh, the information about the typical object in the little Richardson object. All right, so let me finish this talk with an advertisement of, uh, of a paper of Greg Cooperberg, which explains the uh, philosophy one should follow, at least when you want to understand the fixed D uh, situation and our paper with Benoit Collins and Jonathan Novak, when we carry out the general situation, when the rank of the group tends to infinity. Uh, after this talk, you might have a feeling that representation problems of representation theory are kind of uh, small brothers or small sisters of the real problems from the random matrix theory. And essentially any problem from representation theory can be solved if you are clever with random matrices. But this is not the case. If you want to see some problems which appear when you cannot ignore this non-commutativity arising in the representation theory, I recommend you, I advertise another paper, which is this time related to representation theory of symmetric groups. And this is where we uh, encounter uh, genus expansion in which um, this uh, genus expansion, which cannot be really traced to, um, to random matrix theory. All right. Thank you very much. And I hope that during the coffee break, someone from the audience will explain me how to make all these things thanks to topological recursion. So thanks a lot. Um, are there any questions?
either from the Zoom audience or from the room. This will be a question from Octavio Arismendi. Yeah, so what I didn't get is like you have an H there, which gives the whole information about the commutation. So in principle, all the information that you need is there, no? So That's right. here, for example, you show us how to get one, three, two from one, two, three, and one, two. That's right. So in principle, the, you have the, the questions that you need to solve the, your system. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Yes. Yes. So, 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 but, so in principle, you have an answer, no? Yes, that, that, well, that, this is what was, was, was my message. I'm, I'm, yes, this is what I tried to, to communicate. Yes, so got it right. Yes, this is what so I what I mean is you don't need to, okay, maybe for the asymptotics you need H going to zero, but in principle. Okay, so the, uh, okay, so I don't want to invite the coffee break too much, but uh, um, <laughs> anyway, the, um, the problem with, in the case when you go to, with D to infinity, is that essentially um, you don't, I, I, okay, I seem oversimplified my proof. So essentially, instead of studying, okay, I, I said that I need this, to study these um, K sigmas for evil cycle sigma, but in fact, one should also consider more general traces on the left-hand side. So trace, oh, oh, I got a good formula to explain, okay. So typically a trace is such a beautiful product. And the way these uh, indices are arranged is given by some permutation. Okay, so if you want to carry out this computation fully, you also should consider the evil traces, evil moments in which this permutation is wild. Okay, it does have a true, interpretation as a trace, but these are quantities which you need to calculate. And you also need to find um, a way to stretch out these traces. And okay, by applying commutation relation, you might get a loop. And this loop gives you an extra factor of D. So it might happen that you are stretching, if you, when you want to stretch these traces D, then you end up with some big polynomial in the dimension of your group. And then it's not super clear if the number of factors of Planck constant is sufficient to kill this factor. And so th this is the uh, sort the difficulty which I tried to uh, conceal, but I, you forced me to show the difficulty. Okay, okay, thank you very much. You, you mentioned at the beginning the, the problem of shuffling cards. And actually, the, probably the best way to solve the problem is to use non-commutative representation theory of the symmetric groups. <laughs> this is not maybe not stated that way, but this is what people are doing usually now when they want to prove the convergence to the <clears throat> uniform distribution and study the convergence. So I was wondering, and non-commutative representation theory of the symmetric group amounts to lifting the computations with representations to, <clears throat> to the group algebra. So I was wondering if there was something like that that could happen in your setting because you're handling a lot of permutations and combinatorics of symmetric groups, so maybe. Okay, so definitely if you want to understand shuffling of cards, then we should not study unitary groups but representation of symmetric groups. Yes. So, um, and in fact, I am in this lucky position that representation of symmetric groups are my favorite topic. So I think <laughs> during coffee break, I can entertain you about this. <laughs> Any more questions right now? I think there's already quite a few for the coffee break right now. <laughs> Um, I can still ask something quickly before, maybe. So, um, 
you're you're really using a lot of limiting arguments, but there's there's always well, there's also a lot of theory about like actual uh, actually infinite uh, group like say general linear algebras, and um, the representation theory of those is also given by any kind of partition and. I was wondering if you could do something like a general linear algebra with non-commutative uh, entries, but then an infinite general linear algebra, and if that would be related to what you're currently trying to do. Okay, so indeed, after this talk, you might have a one directional viewpoint on asymptotic representation theory. And one of the topics which is or was studied is what can we say about representations of infinite groups, like infinite unitary group or infinite symmetric group. And in this context, um, it's, we are rep one should represent these groups, not on finite dimensional vector spaces, but on you know, infinite dimensional vector spaces. And this causes some difficulties and in particular, if you define the considered notion of irreducibility, then it's not super well, not, not a super nice notion. So the way to address such questions goes through, through operator algebras. So one should consider phenomenon algebras. And the notion of irreducibility should be re replaced by studying representations, which are phenomenon factors. So, so there is a facet of asymptotic representation theory which studies um, infinite groups and infinite representations. Right, and is that also like, does your limiting argument go towards that infinite set, uh, that infinite case, or is, is that okay, really in, unrelated? Oh, that's a super nice question. Um, in the case of unitary groups, I'm not sure if the about the answer, but one could ask similar questions for the symmetric group. And then the situation is well understood. And this was the um, fantastic work in 1980s of uh, Wierschig and Kerov. They understood that the representation theory of the infinite symmetric group as infinity can be Mm, described in a very conceptual and nice way as the limit of the representation theory of finite symmetric groups. And in this way, one produced in the context, the, the asymptotic representation theory is full of very nice uh, probabilistic objects, harmonic measures, random walks on interesting objects. So the answer for symmetric group, the answer is yes. And for the unitary groups, oh, this is a super nice question. Okay, thanks. Are there any more questions? If not, that's, uh, thank Kyoto again.